Welcome to episode two, the history of modern birth. Today, we will be taking a step back in time and a short but deep dive into the history of women and our bodies, and how this has led us to the birthing practices we're in today. We visit the world of goddesses, vulva art, and how women were once revered for their ability to create life, and then move through the times into a world where women were seen as dirty representations of men, whose primary role was to reproduce, and our bodies seen as machines, reflecting the mechanization of the current world. On this whistle-stop tour of history, or should I say her story, you will hear about the godsips, you definitely want to listen to this, the closing off of keyholes during birth, and of course some fun along the way, where you'll even get a sneak peek into the vulva art that one of us loves to make. So put on your seatbelt and start your car, get comfy in your seat, or put on the kettle as you get ready for a few minutes with us. I'm Katie James, and this is the Midwives Cauldron Podcast. Each episode, I'm joined by my incredible co host, Dr. Rachel Reed. Listen in as we hubble, bubble, toil, and trouble our way through aspects of womanhood, midwifery, birth, and lactation. So go on, subscribe now, and hear us on your favorite podcast host. Rachel, we have some ground to cover here, but I think it's important to start somewhere at the beginning um, to really get an idea of how we live in the current society we do as women. We wanted to start the podcast with an episode that we could always reflect back on to give a like a landing point or a point of reference from where most of our current day experiences come from. And really, I want to for us to just talk a bit about, you know, currently where we are in society, but actually this has roots really deep and much further back than, you know, many of us even think about. And and it really does reflect on what is happening with birth, with feeding and with women in society today. Yeah, well, I think you can't really talk about where we are now without looking historically. So when I look at a topic, I always start with history. So whenever I do you know induction or anything like that what I do my first search is looking at the historical basis of whatever it is I'm looking at and I actually started that when I did my bachelor of midwifery was you start right the way back and that's your starting point and then the other thing that you always include is the professional standards of today and those two things go into everything so and these two things I learned from you so thank you very much because that improved my practice a lot because I definitely wasn't the type of midwife who was looking at both ends of the spectrum, but now as a midwife and lactation consultant, I, I do exactly that. I want to know where it started, why it started and what we're looking at now. And then we can look at the frameworks that we're working around. So I think this is, it's a really important point. Yeah. And if we don't understand how something came about, then how can we change it? We don't understand what it's built on. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess I've got root back into this really deeply, right? writing the book that I'm writing at the moment because the first chapter is her story and then all the way through for each section I've gone into the her story of rituals and practice around birth which all just ties in with the history and you know the modern birth practices in the western world are very much still kind of focused around the 1900s practice which was underpinned by the what happened before that. So what I suggest anybody does if they want to uh, real, I mean, obviously buy my book and read my chapter, but Jane Hardwick Collins. (laughs) Get the plug in there, Rachel. (laughs) Absolutely. She's going to totally hate me for doing this. So of course I'm going to do it. Rachel Reed in every good bookstore. Why induction matters. Find it online or in your own great bookstore. Rachel is also currently writing an epic book, which will also be in 
great bookstores close to you very shortly. But just for your special ears, listeners, we are going to be discussing around the first chapter. So see it as a bit of a sneak peek into Rachel Reed's new book coming soon. So what I recommend people do is um, listen to or read Jane Hardwick Collins' Her Story, which is a is a really kind of condensed whistle stop tour through all the really key aspects of change and do a search for Jane Hardwick Collins' Her Story. We're going to get her on this podcast, but I won't ask her to talk about the same thing again. I have plans. Um, and another thing, Marilyn French has written a series of books if you want to go really, really, really in depth. Can you give an example of what um, type of stuff that Marilyn French is writing about? Because actually I haven't read anything from Marilyn French, so I need to add that to my so book. So she's list. actually written The History of Women. So I missed that one. I've missed, you missed I've that missed one. missed the whole history of women. <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> All right. Maybe I should do. So I started this podcast and I haven't read about the history of women. Okay, right. Uh, so I'm just going to leave this podcast now to Rachel and call it The Midwife's Culture with Dr. Rachel Reed. <laughs> Well, to be fair, okay. Marilyn, Marilyn French has done, I think it's four volumes. It's full on. I haven't, I haven't read them all. Exactly. So you... I'm never going to get round to that before the end of the 40th episode of Don't this. worry. Just read, <laughs> just read Jane's work and then you can read my chapter. And I then have. you're sorted. Okay. <laughs> I guess we go all the way, all the way back. Because the way that, that we birth is really a reflection of the culture and society we live in, which is why birth practices change across the globe and in different cultures and different societies. What's normal, and even in little microcosms, you know, what's no what was normal in the northeast of England, which was the cultural norm of the way women birthed yeah. and what they wanted from birth, and how the rituals and the practice around that were very different to over here in Australia with kind of the kind of women who could afford to pay for a private practice midwife. You know, a different culture in that little microcosm. Absolutely. So yeah. we need to bear in mind that this is, very, you know, very generalized history and the way that women birth reflects their own their own culture and their own history. And it's also how history has been written down. So we can only go with what. Yeah. What and certainly got. in terms of written history, that's been men until kind of the 1940s, really, which is when female historians. And then again, it was very much from the Western perspective, the white Western perspective. So we, there's a lot of history that's missing or is there, but just hasn't been kind of uncovered and put into words. It's been passed down orally. But what we do know is that we've had a massive, there's been kind of major shifts in in culture. So yeah, the evidence is that early humans lived in matricentric communities, which is not matriarchal, you know, it wasn't women in charge, but the communities were set up around women and children because that sustained the tribe. And child bearing was obviously a female role because women had the anatomy to do that, but rearing children was a village, you know, it was and men would care for babies, um, so it was more of a a collective and it's interesting because if we look at this in modern day we now know that male partners actually their hormones alter when women are pregnant and immediately after birth yep. so you know women are not the only people who need to be looking after babies you know we haven't evolved to be singularly looking after a baby as a, a woman that's not absolutely not at all and I think that's something that we we really we forget and you know we hear that old adage it's a village that raises, raises a child and it seems like a cliche but my God, is it true? And I love how we call it a matricentric, not a matriarchal. Yeah. Not that you cloned it and invented it. I'm just saying, <laughs> I think it's a really, you know, it's important that we define the differences between that. And at that time, you know, it, the goddesses were female because they created life. So it was obvious that if, if whoever created humans must have been female because humans come out of female vaginas. So the early art was, you know, vulvas on caves. And I know, Katie, you still continue that tradition to the to this day with your I, I have one of your golden vulvas I have one hanging on my wall I uh yes I mean if you listen back to our intro podcast it will tell you how I wanted to be an artist and I I continue that and it's really strange how when I was 15 um all my art was of pregnant women um in paper mache or in clay and then I didn't pick up clay again until about five years ago and started to do pottery on the wheel and then went into sculpture um, and my sculptures are all goddesses female heads female bodies feminist art but predominantly there was a 
I happened to make one vulva and uh, I glazed it gold. This was quite a joy by many of my friends who then wanted one and placed orders, so to speak. And there are many of my golden uh, vulvas or yonis uh, around the globe. And I brought one with me and I do have a yoni on my wall and I have several uh, that are on my shelves. But I mean, for me, what uh, I was reading um, or have been reading when the drummers were women or when the women were drummers. See, that's why our <laughs> podcast that obviously is where our podcast name came from. But actually, I haven't read that book before I thought about our podcast being called When the Witches Were Midwives or the Midge Midges, the Midges, <laughs> when the Midges when the were, were witches. witches, when the Midges were witches. But I read this book. And so for me, I, I knew that there, I knew, I mean, I've read about the history of goddesses and, and, and of course, celebrating birth and to have a God or a spirit or a deity as, as female makes perfect sense because that like you say we're birthing creation, but I had no idea that really throughout my entire life, I've been creating this type of art and then I realized, and I had one of those moments where you put the book down and you just let the tingles in your arm be so enjoyable. And I read that the first sculptures 30,000 years ago that they'd found were of vulvas. And I just thought, yes, if I was reincarnated, I was one of those sculptors making vulvas. And that's why I have vulvas now around the globe and <laughs> some stuck on my walls. You need... I will put a picture up on our Instagram. <laughs> when I when I was in Israel a, a couple of years ago, I went to the um, Israeli museum. You need one of your vulvas in there, Katie. Yeah. So they've got an amazing collection of um, artworks that depict the deities from way, way back, like the earliest, you know, really early human artworks. And it's just breasts and vulvas and female images, um, you know, carved and represented in lots of triangles. And you kind of follow it through the, the times and then it slowly starts to evolve in more kind of obvious human, um, but still female. And then it just starts to shift just as the religion shifted. You then had gods alongside female deities and the, there was men and women depicted. And then you kind of saw the women disappearing and the male gods becoming bigger and then turning into kind of the one, the uni gods, I guess, of, of modern religions. So the depictions of birth way, way back, the very, very early depictions of birth. Um, and it's difficult to know whether they're, because they're cave paintings, whether they're pictures of women, human women giving birth, or whether these are depictions of Mother Earth or whoever was venerated at the time giving birth. But there's always a huge woman birthing surrounded by smaller figures so she's the central the center of the the birth and that imagery carries on all the way through history where birth is depicted as a, a woman birthing who is the center of the picture supported and surrounded usually by two women actually in an upright position in terms of knowing how our ancestors birthed it's kind of difficult because our female ancestors didn't record that in writing but the pictures tell us the story that birth was something that was active and upright and supported by other women throughout history. So if we if we take this as a standing point and we we come forward into the 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 bit of the more recent history where we see that you know there was a uni god and there was you know a segmentation of religions and depending on where you lived in the world and can you just tell us a little bit more about how that impacted on the medicalization of birth and also in terms of the upholding and the, and the standing of men within society um, and how that impacted on, on men that were able to be the ones who became the scientists, so to speak, and then became the surgeons and, and this type of history and how that's changed for us, for us as women? Well, you can probably blame agriculture for everything. <laughs> so when agriculture came about, we then had the need for humans to own land. And then if you're going to own land, you need to own children to work the land. So we, we had a different configuration of, of societies. And that really brought in the stratification of people, because if I've got more land than you, I'm now more powerful than you. And in terms of, and we still have stratifications now of, you know, sex, race, all these divisions where we stratify some people as better than others. That's still here. And that kind of really kicked in at that point. And generally speaking, um, males are bigger and stronger than women. So they fought the fights. They invaded other men's lands. And um, so real, you know, physical prowess became really important. 
Um, and also we needed more children to replace the men who had been killed by the wars. So women's capacity to reproduce and the fact that that was something they were doing, it shifted from them doing that and, the, and society raising the children to actually that was women's primary role and it needed to be to sustain the patriarchy that was rising out of the need to own land. So we had women who were defined by their role to reproduce and that became their role. So as a woman, that is your job. So they were being erased from any other roles in status other than their role as a mother. Mm. And we can see that in the, the development of religions because the, the male gods became more important than the female gods. And the role of women in religion shifted. So, you know, the Catholics realized you know, this whole war over trying, you know, people holding on to their goddesses, you know, in, in the Sheila the gigs and, and all the things, you know, the pagans refusing to give up their idol worship and their goddess worship. And that was across everywhere, you know, the, the people carried on worshiping goddesses. Um, and the, the evolving churches, and, you know, I'll talk more about kind of the Christian Catholic because that was the kind of European influence and they influenced the radicalization of childbirth far more than other religions. Um, so, you know, you had the Protestants and the Catholics over in Europe going, well, you know, these, these people will not stop worshipping <laughs> their goddesses. So they had to give them things um, in place of that. And these stubborn old women. Yeah. And, you know, women were it's so terrible that we won't stop re- worshipping the women that birth, the women that give us some, uh, you know, oh, we've had everything taken away from us. No worries. You go ahead. Thank God there were some stubborn women. They're the ones that still are fighting now. They're our ancestors. Yeah. yeah. So, so for example, the, the three fates were, um, would attend births in Europe and the midwives and the gossips would put out kind of, you know, um, goodies for the three fates so that they would spin and weave a good fate for the baby. And that was really frowned on. Can you just explain a little bit what a fate is or what a gossip is to anyone who might not know? Because um, I, I, I really love how they're described. Um, and, you know, we see this in, in really a modern day in society and with our girlfriends and with the people that you know we love and who support us now there were three well they're they're called the three sisters or the three fates depending and they were just three kind of um supernatural figures i guess deities turn up at a birth in order to spin a fate or declare a destiny on the child you know midwives and gossips were carrying on that tradition in the middle ages and were very much frowned on by the church for doing so but this last kind of hold i guess of the collective culture of women in birth and which is what adrian wilson um wrote about this was the kind of last hold before medicalization really kicked in and this was like so we're talking about europe here um and really the european approach to birth was exported as you know europe colonized the world and spread <laughs> spread their fantastic way of doing things across the uh, globe didn't we just and, and look how well that worked for everybody uh mm. yeah so we'll save that for someone else's <laughs> podcast <laughs> so the collective culture of women was when when a woman was birthing she would call in her gossips and being a gossip so a gossip was a family member or a close friend, and it was a bit like a wedding. You'd be a bit pissed off if you weren't invited to be a gossip at your friend's birth. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and the... <laughs> I'm not the bridesmaid. She had someone else. What's wrong with me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, do I look good in this dress? Will it be fine for the birth? <laughs> and they were actually co- they were actually called god sibs because their purpose was to witness the birth, kind of in a in for the church for, for god for, for god the goddess. well no for god god who was at that point about a man god. yeah for the church god so that that's where god sibs so they were god sibling that's but it turned into gossip because oh god sibling which yeah ah, and that, which went okay. turned into gossip because of what went on so the so then they would attend and the midwife would attend now now We've got a really romantic idea about what midwifery is, which I think is important to look at in terms of traditional midwifery. So I'm going to go off on a tangent now, you know, like this is what I do. Yeah, we do. So midwifery probably came around early, early on. I'm going way back to the kind of God, vulvas on caves time. Oh, my favorite era. (laughs) In that era when Katie was (laughs) painting gold (laughs) vulvas on caves. (laughs) Um, I was totally there. There was a shamans would have been called to difficult births. 
because the idea of danger in birth, because birth has always been dangerous to a certain extent, um, but the idea was that danger came from kind of spiritual unease, like, you know, you'd attracted in a bad spirit or the environment wasn't right. So if there was a complicated birth happening, a shaman would be called. Now, shamans were women as well. There was men and women were shamans. And they would enact ritual practices that would that would safeguard the mother and baby. So that's probably where the origins of midwifery started, was that these were um, experts at managing spirits who were called in for complicated births and that carried on through the centuries and that became the wise woman so the wise woman would be attending a birth not because she had the skills of attending normal physiological birth because that belonged to all women every woman it was part of being a woman was you attended births you saw births you knew knew how to care for a woman during birth how to nurture her how to you know hold hold that time after the birth for her and the baby um, it wasn't a special skill so a bit like a doula now in terms of you know a support person but someone who has uh, more experience in terms of you know if you think about it they would have been witnessing this as as mm. children watching their mothers their sisters their aunties and then that just becomes part of being a skill of support throughout your life and that's what is expected and that's part of living in this cultural uh this type of society yeah it's not a it's you know it's about being with women while they're birthing and midwifery the wise woman of the time and um, who was also the midwife really was invited to birth for her special skills so that would be you know her ability to know how to manage a complication to be able to advise on the correct way to you know do certain things because so in some senses they were working more like the obstetrician in that so when the gossips came to the birth and the midwife came to the birth the gossips did a lot of that emotional physical support of the woman and the midwife kind of the term used was overseeing that's kind of what the term was used in those days she oversaw the birth which meant that she kind of made sure everybody was doing the right thing and that that the rituals were respected you know so so for in some parts of the world everything had to be closed off um, including keyholes had to be closed so was, depending on where the woman was birthing there were particular rituals that needed to be enacted and the midwife would make sure that they happened and the midwife would make sure that um she would identify if things were becoming abnormal and she'd be able to manage that with herbs and you know whatever she brought with her so there was a really strong relationship and it was very clear lines of um roles and responsibilities within that it's the mother's job to birth her baby um it was the gossip's job to support her physically and emotionally and particularly in the postnatal period. There's all kinds of kind of ritual, ritualized um, caring for the woman in that postnatal period. So it was the midwife's job to be there, oversee what was happening in terms of making sure the woman was supported and that if anything, any complications arose, she would use her expertise to manage those. And the midwife was held accountable and midwives have always been held accountable to society and to the community for their practice. And in the Middle Ages, the midwife was held accountable by the church. So in order, you know, they, they would have to report to the church in terms of say, yes, this, you know, the baby was born and it was this woman's baby. They would also be um, involved in the churching of the woman after the lying in period. So they did have a kind of role that was that was in some ways, you know, being accountable to society and the religion and the state, although licensing midwives was interesting because they resisted it and it didn't really work for a long time. So this collective culture of women was sustained. And during that time, it was women being together in a home and men were actually kicked out of their homes. Um, men were responsible often for doing the nidgeting which was when the woman was in early labor, they'd have to go and knock on the doors and get the gossips up and out and call on the midwife. So that was called nidgeting. Why did they call it nidgeting? <laughs> I don't know. No, it sounds like fidgeting. And I'm just wondering if it stems from that, like, because um, they're just like, what the hell can I do? Oh, God. Because, uh, you know, you get that kind of sense of feeling like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm fidgeting around. Nidgeting. I love it. Okay. So this is a scene. Um, where the man is is going out to Nidja and it says, um, when the time draws near of her lying down, then he must trudge to bid gossips, as such she will appoint, or else all the fat is in the fire. You know. I don't get it. I don't get why the fat's in the fire. What? 
Did the was she cooking sausages and she went into labour and then he like, had to like waste them or something? <laughs> Sorry. No, I just love the fact that I don't understand the quote. <laughs> well, then nobody else will. I love it. It's <laughs> so there was resistance, is what I'm saying, and there was attempts. There was attempts to control and to regulate gossips which is why where the word gossip comes from is because these women would get together and they would probably be drinking quite a bit, especially in the postnatal time. And there'd be no men allowed in that area. And they would often be talking about their men folk and not doing their housework. So there was a lot of concern about this in the communities. And, the, you know, the... sounds brilliant <laughs> to be a gossip. I would, I'd definitely go for that job. Making vulvas, being a gossip. I think I've been there. Definitely. All women would have been gossips because we would have all been going to our friends' births and, and having merriment and joy. That's what we do now, hopefully, but not during the birth so much. I mean, as a midwife, I wouldn't want to be on the gin maybe afterwards most of the drinking and celebrations took part, um, place in the postnatal period because the gossips would still attend the woman's home to look after her and you know the baby and do her housework but i think a fair bit of drinking happened as well so there was concerns yeah i was going to say look after her in inverted commas <laughs> as they lie on the sofa four <laughs> gins deep <laughs> so sh shall i read um a little poem that was published about gossips in 1603 yeah, I love this poem. Please read it for us, Rachel. <laughs> Called Tittle Tattle. So the poem says, At childbirth when the gossips meet, find stories we are told. And if they get a cup too much, their tongues they cannot hold. Then gossips all a warning take. Pray cease your tongues to rattle. Go knit and sew and brew and bake and leave off tittle tattle. <laughs> was this written by a man or yeah, a woman? Yeah, of course it was written by a man. But it just gives some, <laughs> it gives some indication of how the collective culture of women was getting backlash even then. And this was before medicalization. So, you know, that kind of set the scene for medicalization, which was built on the religion and philosophy of the time that had evolved, you know, way, way back, thousands of years, that women were dirty, malfunctioning versions of men and that women's primary role was to reproduce. And then alongside that came this development of technology that could save babies' lives, the forceps in particular, um, but they were only allowed to be used by men. Um, and men started attending births um, to rescue babies initially, but then rich women would invite men to attend their births just in case. And we still see that, don't we? We have the just in case still happening today. Absolutely, yeah. And the danger that previously was thought to arise from kind of the physical and spiritual environment shifted to be about coming from the woman's body and that these new technologies and science could really rescue and save women and their babies from the dangers of the woman's body during birth and the body was seen as a machine that was another big shift in thinking as um, men started to study how the body works it was very mechanic mechanistic and we still see that kind of separate mechanistic thinking because whenever cultures where we look at things is through what's happening at the time and at that time machines were a big thing so bodies were seen as machines we nowadays you listen to people talk about um physiology they'll talk about computers you know we download things and we we talk about our brain as if it's some kind of computer um so we reflect that's really interesting that is really interesting because yes it was in the industrialized period in particularly in that early sort of mid 1800s mm. um, and we see those changes women had to go and work in factories I mean in terms of lactation which we'll come on to that's when there was a huge change as well in terms of breastfeeding and mm. what women were able to do but I've never really thought about it in terms of the language we use and you're right we download things our brains are uh, you know we're I don't know user experience I can't even think of computer words but um, you're totally right I uh, just think that's really fascinating. Yeah, so that was the idea, and that made sense to everybody at that time. Was that so? You know, we, so the women's bodies were conceptualised as pistons when they were pushing the baby. It was like fascinating, and we'll we'll talk about this in another podcast when we look at topics. But the way in which topics were explored was, you know, as if it was a machine that was expelling a fetus. In fact, that was actually the terms used by one obstetrician to describe the birth process. Um, 
Yeah. So that's that understanding of birth was evolving. At the same time, we were losing the gossips because they were working in factories. So women couldn't just attend births like as gossips because women started to work outside the home and birth moved into hospital. And kind of the rest, as they say, is fairly recent history. You know, it's only really in the last hundred years that we've had whole scale birthing in hospital in the West. And all of our understanding of birth evolved from that. Um, so, you know, it evolved from, from midwifery becoming nursing as well, because midwifery moved from the community into hospitals, from an autonomous profession to a branch of nursing. Um, and while midwives had previously been accountable to community and to society and to religion, they were now actually held accountable to medicine. And we still are held accountable to medicine, even though we're registered as midwives. You know, who sits on our boards, who regulates our practice? Um, it's still medicine. And this was all before evidence-based practice because evidence didn't evidence-based medicine didn't come in, in until the 70s and not into maternity care until the 90s. So it's really very recent that we've had this idea of you know evidence-based practice. And I'm saying an idea because it's still not a reality, because actually practice is still culturally based. And that's why when people say, Well, we've got all this evidence that says this thing, it's like, well it's not going to happen because it doesn't align with the culture the system isn't broken you know people talk about the maternity system being broken it's not it's absolutely perfectly reflecting what it evolved from i think that's a really really important point to make and and what you've just been talking about throughout history it's about the cultural practices of the time um and how they reflect on what we're doing with with lots of things within uh within health, within how we care for people. And yeah, exactly what we're doing now. It's yes, there might be the evidence, but culturally what's been going on and how many places and how many times do we hear, but this is how we've always done it, or this is how it's done here, or this is what women want. Um, I know that's thrown in, you know, back in terms of uh, I've had many discussions trying to extend the the length of, say, a prenatal class for women on feeding and on postnatal issues. You know, you, you're given, so to speak, two hours to teach about everything to do with the postnatal aspect and breastfeeding. And you're given uh, an allocated time slot of maybe six hours to talk about birth. And what is always has always been told to me when I've tried to allocate for longer time is, but women don't want this. This is not culturally what women want. And, and I think we as health professionals and we as society almost make the decisions for the women. And it's very difficult to get out of that. That's from my perspective. I don't know if you feel if that's going along with what you're seeing. Oh, we do a lot of women blaming and saying, well, women want this and women want that. And it's like, well, but yes, maybe they do. But where is that coming from? And how much of that is actually to do with the messages we're transmitting to them and the systems that have been built up and then the belief systems that have underpinned those. And, you know, it's like women's understanding of birth is often underpinned by the same things that health professionals are, which has not changed since the 1900s. And, you know, we still plot labor on a graph because we're still thinking mechanics. Yep. You know, we still think that exactly. the body is a machine that can be plotted onto a graph and we can make it more efficient by the use of technology. And that's what underpins the increase in inductions, the increase in augmentation. All of those interventions are based on that belief that the, the body can be mapped onto a nice neat graph and that we can manage it in a kind of really objective way, which doesn't actually fit with individual women in their bodies. And what we've got to remember is that modern day practitioners, myself included, we learned, you know, when we did our degree, our knowledge was from textbooks and yes, research and practices, because most of what you learn is from what you actually see. And if we've got from the 1900s, you know, women were in the West, women were restrained on delivery tables, actually had straps to strap the woman down on, they had twilight sleep and their babies were removed by obstetricians with episiotomy routine and instruments. And midwives then learned from that, you know, I was, I was um, talking to a midwife, I was writing about um, episiotomy in my book, who trained in the 1970s in England. And she was taught that you do an episiotomy for every first baby. And then you do one for every woman who's had one. So that's every other, but you know, yeah. and that, and then by the 90s, yeah. so then that's yes, everyone. And by the 90s, when we changed, 
trained. Luckily, there'd been research showing that, you know, it's not a good idea, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we weren't taught that. So there was a shift in practice, but we, we were able to see that. And if you look at textbooks of today, they're still, I was just looking at one of the, my recent textbooks, um, and it's still a torso on a bed, on its back, with a baby, this is the drawing, with hands pulling the baby out. So if you're learning, to, so you learn that from the textbook, then you go into wow. a lab and there's a torso, a, you know, a model that costs thousands of dollars yep. um, or pounds or whatever yep. with the baby in it. And then you learn the techniques of pulling the baby out of the torso. So then how are you then meant to go into a birth room and care for a woman who's actually pushing her own baby out of her own vagina without anybody's hands there? It's just... We've, and she's moving and she wants to change position and she wants to do things that, oh, I've not seen this before. So then as the health professional or the health, the care provider, you then have anxiety and fear because you don't feel like I've been trained in this. I don't. Is this safe? Um, so a lot of I think what happens with us is through fear of of keeping the mother and baby safe mm. of being the in quotes expert and the the person who's meant to hold this safe space but also having that as a midwife you know this this knowledge that you are a support person you are meant to be with woman you're meant to be um following her lead and her guidance but um you know, if she's suddenly jumping up and going around the room and getting in all to these different positions, this is like, oh, what do I do here? Uh, I'm not sure I've seen it. I have a really vivid memory of being a very newly qualified midwife, just moved to London. And I had a woman who I think she was from Somalia. She spoke very little English. She came in in really um, active, strong labor. And she literally danced around the room she got on top of the chair she squatted standing on the chair she was up on the bed then she was trying to climb on the toilet um it was an incredible dance of which I was frightened I had fear and anxiety because I really was like I've never seen this before and at that point I did not I didn't know how to handle it so to speak I wasn't sure but then I I tried my best to stand back and you know this is a long time ago but she birthed that baby pretty darn quickly and at that point she just got on the bed and squatted and that was her um, preferred position and the thing is she was there with her sister and her sister was not phased at all so that calmed my response down but it was something I had never witnessed before it was a few months out of training but my goodness, her body was obviously moving that baby down and shifting it into the right place. And she birthed beautifully, easily, um, and had a glorious birth. I will never, ever forget because it was just the most unusual dance method I had ever seen in my life. Um, and a lot of hollering and, and sort of music and uh, unusual noises as well that I also hadn't seen um, where I'd trained. And it was it was it was a real turning point. It was fantastic for me to witness. So, yeah, I think one of the things blocking us is, again, it goes back to that, you know, as midwives, we're very much taught that, again, danger and risk arise from the woman, that we need to be in control. You, know, you hear the word conduct the birth, deliver the baby, that we are accountable for the safety of the mother and baby. And they're really dangerous. So that's where our practice is built. So to and this is why I actually did my Ph.D. was that we were taught to do all this stuff to women when they were birthing, control the delivery, you know, coach the pushing. And I really started to question yes. that. Yes. And the less, the more I backed off and didn't do things. And do you know what? Babies came out of women's vaginas better without me doing all the things I'd been taught to do. And do you know what? Women's babies weren't dangerous. And maybe the things I was doing to the woman were dangerous that really got me back into the looking at what it is we do and why we do it. And it's, but were you scared? Were you scared to take that back seat? Because I know I was, and I actually followed very much by speaking to you. You gave me the the insights, you gave me the knowledge and the confidence, I have to admit, definitely, um, from following your lead, from them reading stuff that you had told me about. Um, and again, looking up to you as like this big sister and knowledgeable other. Um, and But it was scary to, um, to pull back. I was really lucky that I went into an environment where I actually had midwives who were very much 
um, following this method already, but they were almost an, anom an, 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 an anomaly. It's great when you actually need to use that word within our um, sphere of practice and you can't say it. Um, they were an, an anomaly, almost, um, and they taught me, I can, you know, I had experiences with midwives who would say, stand back and watch Katie and we were lucky we were in a hospital that there was two midwives that would always go in with the woman definitely towards the end of, of birth but where we had trained we were very much it was you have to be the sole midwife on your own and um, I can remember going down to London in this smaller hospital and um, after the first few births that I had been at I would come out and say oh Mrs so-and-so has um, given birth and everything's fine and they would say to me, gosh, that must have been a quick birth. And I'd be like, oh, no, just, yep. And then I didn't realize until a few weeks later that at every birth, they had two midwives there and from as early on as possible. And it was just a joy to behold because then you would learn from other people's practices. Um, I started to really learn from some really good experienced midwives who taught me to really stand back. But if I hadn't have had that, I would still be going in with this kind of fear of I need to manage the birth. I need to um, be present. I need to be doing something because that's what I am. I'm the midwife. I'm there to control it, to make sure it goes well. Um, and it wasn't so much about only listening to the woman's body. And I mean, my experience in the birthing, in the birthing world or the birthing unit was fairly short lived and I and I moved into different fields. But um, it was quite hard to take a stand back and take a different look at your training. And I would imagine if other midwives around you are still following that route, it must be quite difficult. Did you find it difficult to pull back? Or were you just thinking, you know, I've got this research, I've got this evidence, um, I've got this history? I can do this or, or how did you approach that? No, I think I actually benefited from not having this because as you know, in the UK, we didn't have a second midwife in the room. So you were kind of on your own in the room with the woman and her partner and, and whoever else she'd invited to the birth. And you didn't leave the room until you went out, you know, to do the tick on the board. Um, and that, and I guess, you know, the more I thought about it and the more I read and I didn't do it, I didn't go straight in and go, I'm not going to do anything. I just backed off. So I stopped telling women to push, stopped telling multips to push. So that's women not having their first baby. And do you know what? Babies easy come out of women who've had babies before. So then I started not telling women having their first babies to push. And do you know what? They still push their babies out without any instruction. And um, I stopped putting my hands on when babies came out. I just, I just did it in little steps backwards, little steps backwards, which then gave me confidence. And really the women taught me, you know, I, I had to just trust them and re, you know, and just, just, just kind of reframe what my role is here from that kind of egoic cape wearing, I'm the expert here. And back to that real traditional midwifery, which is actually, you know, you're the expert here. And my job here is to kind of nurture you, care for you while you do birth your baby and manage anything if it happens you know to if you have a hemorrhage I'll sort that out but really it, you're more likely to have a hemorrhage if I'm doing things and when I was in private practice in particular you know I was actually scared of doing things you know intervention to me by the time I was in private practice I understood that what I did to a woman was a risk and you particularly a woman at That's really interesting yeah and a woman at a home birth you are the only person there to manage the risk you know or you or a or the you know and another midwife we often just worked as a single midwife initially until rules came in so if anything happened i couldn't hit a buzzer on a wall and get everybody to come and help me with a hemorrhage so i would do everything i possibly could to eliminate risk from the environment and that that wasn't the, the woman wasn't the risk it was me distracting her when she was you know interacting with her baby after birth that would cause the hemorrhage it was you know someone's phone going off or me turning on lights or so I started to see what I did as an intervention which just completely shifted my practice even more so I guess when you're saying you know was I worried I guess yeah it was initially because we were taught to be the hero and that we have to conduct and deliver and but I started to doubt that and just try a different way and 
and, and look at the research and support myself with um, caring for women throughout the whole thing and not just seeing that little like segment, you know, the just the birth, but seeing them postnatally and going, wow, that woman recovered so much better and her experience of birth was so much better because I just kept out of the way. That also really reinforced to yeah. me that, you know, just Rachel, you need to sort yourself out, tuck yep. your ego away and keep out of it. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, we all go in with the best intentions as mm. midwives and, and no one's going in um, trying to do harm at all. And actually, as a midwife in particular, you're there, you want to be with women, but sometimes we don't actually know that we're doing or we're causing harm because we're following what we've been taught. We're following what the, the elder, wiser women midwives around us perhaps are showing us or teaching us or talking about and that then depends again on the culture look you know my my move from one tertiary unit to a small unit and I had a completely different experience that made me become much more um thinking about what I'm doing hands off um also very similar allowing things to just happen but being very aware of of being mindful of of anything cropping up where I need more support, but um, having, having an environment that allowed that to happen, having older, wiser midwives who were very skilled in home birth and then brought that intuition or brought that, that thought process into the birthing room. Um, and, you know, just simple things like I can remember being a young new midwife and, um, and there was an old midwife, she, she wasn't there very long because she was about to retire, but she just had this beautiful nature about her and just showing me things that no one had ever had time for in, uh, in my learnings as a student midwife in a big tertiary unit. And this mother who's on all fours and showing me parts of the back and how uh, the, uh, the cervix. What's the bottom of the back called? Well, rhombus of Michaelis, but that's probably <laughs> named after a man. So, <laughs> I'm good, aren't I? Good with my with my um, birthing knowledge. But I mean, it's just showing me parts of the woman's body that's moving, and we just stood or we sat watching her and supporting her, and we were in this beautiful, quiet, dark environment, but in a hospital. Um, and I just remember learning so much. I used to love it when I'd be on shift with her and I could get her to come in at the end of birth or, or be the second midwife to her because I would watch her. On the other reverse side of the coin, having the second midwife, there was times when, of course, you'd have a more senior midwife who would then be directing me to tell this woman to push. And I can remember, you know, fingers in the perineum, um, push down here, come on, good girl, all of this type of stuff, which I recoiled at. You know, I think of it differently now, but at the time I just recoiled because it felt wrong and I didn't like it and I didn't want to call someone that. But I was often, um, as a student midwife, I was not told off, that's not the right word, but I was told there was a report back to my the university lecturer that I needed to be more directive in when I did active pushing with women, I needed to be more vocal. And, you know, I'm quite a loud person and I can have a big personality, but in birth, it just, I never felt that that helped. It felt wrong, but I couldn't uh, sort of extrapolate my thoughts as to why it felt wrong. And so what I found that I was doing when I had uh, two people in the birthing room was that there was practices which I thought I will never, ever do this to a woman. And there was practices which I thought, I am so grateful to have learned this. So um, a different experience to you. And unfortunately, you know, there are times when you do see things that you really think, I will never, ever do this to a woman. But unfortunately, at the time, you don't feel strong enough to stand up for that. And I don't think that's just with midwives. It's also with the, the obstetricians. And we have this, this problem where, where we don't necessarily find our voice. And I think that's time that will come at another podcast where we talk about how we can be strong as an advocate for the woman. Because that's, that's a minefield and it could be a huge challenge, particularly when you're a new midwife to, to have that strength of voice. But yeah. Well, we're socialized as women to not be awkward and difficult and to not challenge authority. Know your place, woman. Yeah, which I've never been very good at. Um, and then as student midwives and new midwives, you're groomed to meet the needs of the institution. And at the same time, the women are groomed to 
you know, through the antenatal period to see us as experts and to kind of give their bodies over to the experts in order to be safe. And so when they're saying, you know, oh, women want that, women want that because we've groomed them to believe that if they don't have that, then they're not going to be safe because they can't trust themselves and their bodies and their babies because we are the experts. And, you know, it's how, how we shift that in a system that's evolved from that history and is still so much, you know, it's still really embedded in there. And we're starting to see we're now at the situation where we've got all of this research evidence supporting the physiology and the not doing things to women um yes we're getting research that you know we'll talk about in other podcasts that can be interpreted to support intervention because of the way in which it's conducted and and then translated the findings translated but we've got all of this research to support the promotion and support of physiology and respectful maternity care we've got world health organization saying don't tell women to push we need to have respectful maternity care um, you know, so at a big picture thing about how we need to respect women and at a small picture thing of, you know, don't do episiotomies, don't tell women to push, don't do these things. And yet it still carries on. And we're getting almost a kickback from the institutions that are then looking at guidelines that say, you know, for example, in Queensland, our normal birth guidelines are actually pretty good in terms of respecting women and saying that there isn't any evidence to support this, that and the other. And, you know, don't tell women to push, support them to follow their own bodies. Um, and yet we then have workplace directives that tell midwives that they've got to have their hands on the perineum, that they've got to do these things. And then the midwives, if they don't do those things, they've got team leaders watching them so they'll you know be reprimanded and if there's a bad outcome even though it's got nothing to do with whether they had the hands on the woman or not they will be held accountable and so there's a huge amount of fear because of the sense of responsibility and accountability and you know I th think this is going to be a whole podcast in itself because it's it's huge and I think that's a key the main thing midwives contact me about and students is how to navigate what the system that we've got now. I think that's probably a great place for us to um, wrap up on this episode. We've really done the whistle stop tour of, uh, you know, modern birth and the practices and the history of, or the her story of women. And it's brought us back to current day. So I think this has been really been such a great time talking to you through this because you have such a knowledge. And I know there's many people out there with this absolute awesome knowledge. Um, and it absolutely fascinates me. I've I'm really relatively new to really this this history of 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 us as women. The more I think we read, the more knowledge we have, the more we can spread this message of, you know, there's a reason why we're doing what we do now. And I think this has been a really fabulous episode to kind of start off our, our podcast and really of what we will be talking about over the next episodes. And hopefully you will join us because this is our passion. This is where our, our hearts and our minds lie. And we are really looking forward to some of the guests that we will be having on the podcast and some of the topics that we will be going through. So stay tuned for the next episodes and we will see you there. I'm also going to ask you a very little favor. Please like us, please subscribe. And if you'd be ever so kind, please pop us a comment in the podcast app that you're listening to. And we will see you next episode on the Midwives Cauldron podcast. And go on, I'll let you have a few bloopers again this episode. I think this is going to be a habit with the way we record. So there's a the French satire written on childbirth, which includes a scene in which a man laments that he is no longer the master of his home. So this is what was going on when women were in labour in early postnatal time. And this was about him being sent out to kind of knock on the doors and to nidge it to get the to get the gossips and the midwife there. And um, in this satire, it says, when the time draws near of her lying down, then must he trudge to bid bishops. Oh. <laughs> must he trudge to bid bishops? <laughs> what? Bang. What? <laughs> Bang. <laughs> no, I'm keeping it. I'm keeping that. What are you talking about? Oh, shut up. Right, it. Let me do it again. Stop. Bang. Bang.